What's up, guys? So, we are back again. Uh, I can't believe I'm becoming a <laughs> political pundit of sorts. Like, take me back to the times where I didn't really bother about what was on the news and stuff like that. Good times. But, yeah. So, today we are going to go through the NDC manifesto. Uh, my reactions. I'm guessing I'll make an, another video to compare the two manifestos so that both parties can get their due singular videos and then a combo. And then also, uh, I will do a, a reaction to uh, Baumier's time with the media thingy. So um, let's just jump right into it. I want to make this video shorter than the previous one. Now to begin, if you watch my previous video, which should I'll probably have pop up somewhere around here. My explanation or my definition of a manifesto is a wish list or to a certain degree, a social contract or a social wish list that a political party presents to the public in hopes that the wishes they think the public wants are in line with the wishes the public actually wants so that the public would then in turn vote for them if you understand that and if you watch my previous video i also stated that with it being a wish list it means that idealistically many um politicians ideally are hoping to be able to accomplish many of these things not all will be accomplished and depending on va a variation of circumstances accomplishments may be feasible or otherwise then i also talk about believability or like i said the onus of believability when it comes to a manifesto lies lies more with the current government than the uh group that is seeking to come into power this is because you the current government know what is going on you know all the deals that you have you know how much money the country has and all the, you you know the inner workings the uh incoming government or the people who want to become the new uh, become the new government that's your opponent they have less information they may have some inclination as to what's going on but they may not have all the intricate details so basically in this context the wish list of the npp has to be more believable because it shouldn't be a wish list per se because you know what's going on so it shouldn't really be your, your document it shouldn't really be a wish list it should be a pointed um direct conversation about what you plan to do with what you know we have and then on the other hand the ndc's own can be more of a wish list because they may not have all the information now let's jump into it to make it shorter i'll just put them into groups and then give my sentiments on all of that now the first one is from um george opari ado ndc national youth organizer i'm using gh1 tv's twitter so they are media clip thingies the pictures with the captions and everything after today, Ghanaians will be able to tell the difference between NPP and NDC and who means well for this country. We NDC have solutions to the problems the good people of Ghana are facing. And finally, why should we edit our manifesto when their NPP manifesto was AI generated? <laughs> so, in my previous video, I'm always going to call back to the previous video with NPP, the NPP being the current, like in, in a boxing match, they are the champion, right? And they stand to lose the title. They, it is in their best interest to have been focused on being extremely positive and extremely confident, not throwing blows. It's like you are punching down because you're on the up right now. It's like you're punching now, so you shouldn't really do that. On the other hand, NDC can punch up as hard as they want at any point in time. So this particular statement is really funny about the AI generated one about the NDC having solutions to the problems of Ghana and the difference between MPP and NDC. I don't, I don't really want to get into this because it's going to derail me or put me into a tangent that could last for a very long time. But all I will say is that every group 
believes they have solutions. And if you come into power, just don't forget that you said you had the solutions. So that when we come asking you that, where are the solutions you said you had, you don't be acting brand new like you, you never said any of these things. So yeah, I will keep that, I'll keep it moving. Osman Ayariga, Deputy National Youth Organizer, NDC. The NDC is a party that delivers on its promises. The NDC manifesto is one that will create more jobs for the youth. Now, I have a problem with the create more jobs for the youth based on the manifesto statement. I, I, I mean, I get what he's saying, but you don't say things like this, especially when uh, media houses will clip it in this framework. Maybe there was probably, I watched the whole thing as well. There's probably a lot more that he said. Definitely was a lot more he said that could have um, made this statement fuller for you to understand. But you can't say, but basically what he's trying to say is that the NDC's manifesto or the NDC's wish list is going to include several policies or promises that will provide jobs to the youth. At the end of the day, a promise, a, a, a policy or a wish list, and to a certain degree, a promise can be broken. So I don't know. Uh, hopefully it is true. We don't know for sure. Next is from Honorable Sylvester Mensa, former DC MP, former NDC MP for La Dade Kotopon. Corruption must be made unattractive. It is extremely true. If the NDC government can promise the people of Ghana that when they come into power, they will put several frameworks to ensure that corruption, especially in that part of the country, because corruption is a far bigger issue in Ghana than that we think it is. It has gone past a, a, a it's, it's currently a way of life. It's a cultural thing now. And I say it's a cultural thing. It's gone past just a habit or something. It's a way of life because increasingly it's like let's say for instance you're trying to get your driver's license or let's say you're trying to get your passport or something like that it, it feels like it's a no-brainer to go through the not so to go through the dodgy areas if you actually want to get your thing on time and it, it's like because the systems don't work very well it has encouraged corruption to a certain degree to the point where it's seen as a way of life it's seen as a no-brainer it's seen as something you must do. It is seen, this is, this is the kicker, it is seen as something an intelligent person would do to save time. It's crazy, but it is what it is. Next, Dr. Cassiel Atofos and Minority Leader. Now, this dude's part I really remember because he said one thing that I had said in my previous video should rather be the focus of a government, and I'll touch on that. He says, the next NDC government will abolish COVID levy. This NPP government is a monumental failure. Okay, so what he talked about, the, these things that he said, the NDC government will abolish the COVID levy. I mean, it's, it, it, it will be great. It would really be great. I feel like this leans into the thing he said, which is that the NDC government would be focusing on micro um, economic factors as opposed to macroeconomic factors, which which I said in my previous video is extremely important because we put you into power to make our lives better, put policies in place to make our life better. We didn't put you into power to make us look attractive for foreign investors to come in to the country to potentially give us jobs, but even when they do give us jobs, the jobs don't pay as great and the tax incentives rendered them coming into the country moot. It's, 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 it's a huge conundrum. But if we focus on, okay, let's, let's get into some philosophy, some philosophical conversations. Now, if you guys who are watching remember anything about social studies, we remember Abraham Maslow's uh, Pyramid of Needs, I believe that's what it's called. In Abraham Maslow's theory, he, he basically theorizes that hu a human or the average person goes, in terms of their needs, goes from one stage to the other. Now, to add on to that theory, when you fulfill one need, the next, the next uh, step in the pyramid becomes a want initially in the sense that, okay, at the base of the pyramid, it is food shelter 
those are and security those are kind of like the main benchmarks when you don't have any of those things it's a pressing need anything on top of that is a what and we know that you have to value your needs over your wants so when you fulfill the baseline one which is the food security and shelter the next stage becomes something you look at as a need and then the third level is a want so you then you pull yourself up the ladder, ladder like that that is extremely important why do i say this because many many governments in the world inadvertently some of the successful governments in the world inadvertently do focus on the microeconomic um uh the benefits of their citizens let's take for instance the united states of america you could tell that they were really worried about yes they were worried about the macroeconomic factors but the microeconomic factors of the effects of the covid um um issue at what, what, what was it again pandemic sorry i can't believe i forgot that the covid covid pandemic they they needed people to be liquid for transactions to continue because at the end of the day no matter how much you see these big companies all these big companies the amazons the facebooks and everything they rely on the multiplicity of individuals in a society they rely on the fact that one two three one million people will use their services and that's how they generate income but if that one two three one million people don't have the money to do anything everything in the system grinds to a halt that is why i kept saying that every government needs to focus on microeconomic factors because once hum a human being is satisfied with one thing they won't know so if the average person in ghana is able to eat find a place to sleep they are secure and stuff they will want more and they, they will in turn start going out of their way to make businesses to employ people why are we never mind moving on uh cc quite i hope i got that right general secretary of the ndc ndc our country has systematically been brought to a level of hopelessness today we will listen to the unveiling of policies that will bring back to our country over the past years we have seen systematic degradation of our nation a country that was on a path of transformation now this last statement about the we have seen the systematic degradation of our nation all that stuff. posterity allows us to say these things posterity i keep i said this in my previous video we are only able to truly quantify a person's capability as a president in a posterior manner in the sense that posterity we as we are done with a person and that, that person's is, is, time has passed then we can look back and see it then compare to the new person and be like okay this is actually good or this was bad i dare say as many people who disagree and as many people who agree it is statistics i said is statistics will allow me to say this that there is a possibility that posterity will also vindicate our current president his excellency Lala Abidagwa Kufuaru. to some that is the most ludicrous thing to think about to others it is a no-brainer so saying some of these things like i said it's only posterity that will allow us to address these things um when he speaks about hope, the country being hopeless and now being hopeful. I'm not going to lie, it, it does feel like that way. I, I talk to a lot of people when I take an Uber and stuff like that. And quite a number of the people I've spoken to, I ask them, oh, are you going to vote? They're like, no. And the running rhetoric in their reason for not voting is that they voted the previous time and they feel like they were dealt a shitty hand. And that's their personal sentiment. But the current running sentiment that was really more troubling for me was the fact that they said, they don't want to vote because if anything happens right and they vote someone into power and that person does abysmally that person does terribly they will feel less to blame about the situation apathy is a terrible thing for the people in the country to feel to be honest any form of patriotism in the country or for the country is dead or is at least is in the icu as much as we are hopeless it is hope that gives us dry but it is also the hope that kills it is such a very interesting situation we find find ourselves in as a country uh honorable samokujetua blackwap mp for north tongue 
When it comes to good governors, President Mahama is unmatched. In his fight against corruption, we reject the baseless claim that the two parties are the same. NDC is different. Scholarships will return to the brilliant but needy. Demolition of embassies due to loot and share is coming to an end. Without integrity, the corruption war cannot be fought. Via MPP best performance is President Mohammed's worst performance. So basically, his focus is on corruption and stuff like that. And then let me touch on the scholarships for the brilliant but needy. I thought the free SHS was the reason why we didn't need this thing again. But I'm guessing maybe he's talking about uh, uni students. <laughs> A lot of transparency is needed in these programs so that we actually know what is going on. I wanted to tell a story, but I'm not going to say anything. It was in the past, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, what He talks about integrity and he's basically talking about corruption. This is what I would say to the NDC, if anyone is going to listen, to ensure that the people have a modicum of trust in your stance on corruption. Right now, what you can do is that as a collective, you can declare your assets. Because you, if you realize that's one of the issues that um, arises, where people get into positions of power, they don't declare their assets. So we don't know what they came into power with. And then they leave and we are saying that they've amassed wealth, but we have no concrete way of ascertaining this. At the NDC, if you guys really want to show that you are trustworthy and you are taking the corruption thing seriously that is one of the things you have to consider declare your assets it's going to be tough it's going to be very very tough but if you do it that hope you're looking to put back into the Ghanaian populace you might actually be able to do it next is asiedu in ktr ndc's national chairman in this manifesto ndc has provided Ghanaians with clear actionable and concise solutions the 24-hour economy policy has been stated clearly in simple terms to enable everybody associated with it except those who intentionally refuse to understand the current government has introduced a plethora of taxes that have brought excruciating hardships that is true there are a lot of taxes that they <laughs> One of the biggest, one of the biggest, um, let me say it's a PG. One of the things you go feel slack. See, one of the issues where you go feel slack is that you go to a restaurant to eat, right? And then the tax is not inclusive. So in your mind, you've budgeted, you've looked at the menu, you put everything together, and then they slap you with that 22 to 25% extra tax at the end of the day that you were not waiting for. Yo, that's the worst, one of the worst type of situations to be because they'll throw you chop out finish. You about to chop finish. So what are you going to do? Man, some of these taxes really, really, really to go. Some of these taxes need to go. As for the 24-hour economy, I do believe that Rwanda had had or has implemented something similar. And the idea, when you watch the manifesto, which I did, um, his ex his Excellency, the ex-president, uh, John Dramani Mahama, talks, breaks, out, breaks it down a bit more to a more acceptable level. Because my thing about the 24-hour um, economy was that there were quite a number of constraints. The major constraints or the major kind of dull stuff about the 24-hour economy is that the industries that require multiple shifts are already doing it. If they are not doing it, there's a reason they are not doing it. And most often, that reason is a lack of raw material. To a certain degree, the lack of raw material can affect. Because if I have the capacity to produce a certain quantity of stuff, but I'm not able to get the raw materials to do it, then why am I running multiple shifts? I'll just do it in the regular because I don't have much to show anyway. But if you're able to get that, the 24-hour economy works perfectly for the security agencies. I was really happy that uh, uh, Mahama talked about that because if we got three clear-cut rotations of um, the police and the military, it means that you can employ more police, you can employ more in the military, which is extremely important because I believe the UN and other security, international security bodies have talked about how Ghana's, based on where Ghana finds itself, it, it needs more people in the security agency. It needs to beef up its uh, security force numbers. So, yeah. Next is... 
Professor Nana Jane, NDC running mate. Uh, she's looking to be the vice president to the Mama. Women's Development Bank will provide low interest loans to women entrepreneurs. Our manifesto emphasizes digital literacy. We need a government and political party that understands the issues affecting women. We'll remove all the obstacles that prevent girls from moving up. John Mahama is a leader who understands the challenges women face. This manifesto is not a set of attractive and empty promises. Uh, but the, the last one was, yo, Mans was talking, yeah? Mans was talking. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, Muhammad, and not to fault him in any way, but Muhammad talked like he wasn't only going to run for four years. And I'm not saying that he was he's thinking about anything crazy or anything like that, but policies were talking, he was talking about, yeah, this is like some eight term, eight, eight year term kind policies. I'm guessing he's hoping to pass on the baton and then for there to be some level of continuity. But yeah, yo, anyway, huh. I feel like Professor Nana Jane's heart is in the right place. My thing is that I feel like the youth, the female youth, could latch onto these statements and actually reg resonate with it and agree with it and even push it. The older female population, though, don't. Because culturally speaking, especially in Ghana, women are expected to be meek, like that whole rhetoric. It's a thing that the older generation really kind of had. So I don't know if, as a running mate, if that is your pitch. I don't know if that's enough. I've heard some of the most ludicrous reasons why women vote. Like older women, like people in my mom's age group and stuff like that. It's crazy. <laughs> like I've heard some of the most ridiculous reasons. So I don't know. But I will say about the Women's Development Bank, I've forgotten what article it was, but I read an article about how Ghanaian women are actually one of, uh, one of the most, if not the most industrious women globally in terms of their control of a business and the markets, the business market share that they have in a, in a country, the percentage business market share that they have. These things will help a lot of women and like I said, her heart is in the right place. Let's just hope that it translates into something positive. Now to John Tramani Mahama, NDC flag bearer. We are going to place Starlink in every secondary school. We will fight corruption by deploying Operation Recover All the Loot, aka Oral Principle. All politically exposed persons will not be allowed to acquire state assets. We will abolish teacher licensure exam will rationalize taxes and abolish the obnoxious elect. We will investigate NPP's opaque gold for oil deal. We will institute duty-free car loans for teachers and health workers. We will restore the licenses of all wrongfully collapsed banks and financial institutions. We will provide free sanitary pads for girls in schools. Oof. A youthful population doesn't have the luxury of trying a driver's meet who learned from a driver who crushed the Ghanaian vehicle. We will establish modern dialysis centers in regions without dialysis centers. We will construct a state-of-the-art 500-bed children's hospital in Ghana. We need a change that will usher in an accountable government. We are going to shift our attention from grammar schools and building more technical and vocational schools. Cocoa production has plummeted under this kind government. Our democracy, economy, governance, and attitudes need a reset. This government has received more revenue than all governments in the history of Ghana combined. President Akufuado is indeed the president Ghana never got. This government must begin writing their handing over notes if they haven't already. Ghana is bleeding. Ghana's soul is calling for change. That's a lot of stuff. I feel like that's one of the things I remember, remember him talking about was about an intercity train system where they would um, they would have foreign partners who would come in, assess the situation, value how much it would cost to build it, build it, and then they strike a, a, a deal in the sense that, okay, you build this interview um, system and then you reap all the money of it for, if it's 25 years, yeah, 25 years, and then 
once that money you've recouped all your investment plus whatever interest you are looking for then we come back to the table to discuss how we re we as a country gain control over the real system i found that to be interesting i don't know if you could do that for years but i found that to be very very interesting now the styling thing i don't know i haven't been in shs for a while now but how many of these SHS kids are allowed to bring their phones? Okay, well, this guy, this current government said we're going to give tablets to students. As to how many or if they've done it, I don't know. But I do not have a very good memory of us being allowed to have our own gadgets and devices. You're only allowed to go to the computer lab, which was a bit small. So the Starlink thing, in, in theory, sounds great. But me, I'm, I haven't been in SHS for well over a decade now. I don't know. Uh, the recovery. I said this before on a tweet that I posted some time ago. That if NDC, one of the things NDC needs to promise the people of Ghana, in, if they want to win, is that they are going to try and recover all the missing monies that have been stolen from us, us. And that is still true. And he says they are going to do that. And then he says all politically exposed persons will not be allowed to. This, like I said, declare your assets now. If you want us to believe you and trust you, declare your assets now. I don't know why he's abolishing the teacher licensure exam. I don't know much about that. But he says he's going to abolish the E levy. I'll touch on why this is really interesting for me. He says you invested. Like I said, the gold for oil deal is all about we are coming for you for taking our money, stuff like that. Okay. We will institute duty free. Now, I do not recall him seeing a duty free car loan thingy. What I recall him saying was that they were going to institute a form of payment plan for the duty. So, if you're a teacher and you brought in a vehicle, he did mention that uh, the wrecked vehicles, you allow them to come back into the country because not many people can afford brand new cars, which is true. And that if you you they value the you get the duty you create a system where you can pay in bits he's not talking about he even made a joke that he's not talking about paying one cd one cd like um his excellency the vice president baumia said with his credit system type thing but yeah it is that's what he says um this is actually really really dicey the restore the licenses of all wrongfully collapsed banks this whole banking thing was just such a weird fiasco type thing and I don't know. It's just mess. It's really, really mess. And we'll provide free sanitary pads. He will shout it out, um, Madam Nana Jane, that she had brought that thing in the past and was abolished. Cool. Good on you. Um, the luxury, the whole drivers meet driver rhetoric. Hey, hey, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Your balance and the alliance. It's cool. Now, I had the dialysis center thing. I don't get it. I don't get why the country is unable to make multiple dialysis centers and why there is such short supply. Because I randomly checked how much uh, a dialysis machine costs. Let me check again. I remember seeing somewhere that a dialysis machine could go for like $200,000. Oh no, it was $60,000 all the way up to like $200,000. But... So if that is the case, I'm seeing some here from Biomedistas going for $17,500. If that's the case, how are we unable to have multiple that? Like, why is this such a shortage of these things? If they, they are extremely important to the healthcare system, so why do we not have more? Is there an issue of maintenance? Like, what is the problem? This is a good promise. We will construct a state of the art 500 bed children's hospital in Ghana. Hmm. I will move on to another. Okay, so no, let me not move. He's made a lot of promises. He's talked about reducing his ministerial appointees to 60. The issue here is that you're talking about a lot of building, a lot of blah, 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 about like things that will require money. And but in turn, you also talk about abolishing a lot of taxes. So it sounded like we may go back on the borrowing thing. And that's one of the reasons why we are in this mess. So I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, I think it's this four years. You know, I'll say I've worked my manifesto. What's my wish list at the end would be. We need a change of government that's accountable. Yeah, the only way a government can be accountable is if the constitution has frameworks to force them to be accountable. Right now, that doesn't exist. Uh, we are going to shift attention from grammar schools and build more technical. This was an extremely important thing to me because 
ground schools that he's called is basically focused on white collar jobs type thing and maybe to a certain degree blue collar jobs to a certain degree technical education schools now it's always bugged me that uh, our political leaders have not thought outside the box when it comes to today technical and vocational skills is not just carpentry and farming and stuff like things like data entry is a technical and a vocational skill data analysis to a certain degree if you there are so many other ways you you talk about a lot of this digitalization digital blah 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 there's a, such a clear-cut shot there's such a clear-cut shortcut to leapfrog development if you are talking about going uh, doing development via technological or after that it shocks me that we are not actually doing that it's really really surprising but hey it is what it is i like this um like recently okay not recently some time ago i was looking for a blacksmith and i couldn't find it i love blacksmithing the concept of blacksmithing is really cool i watch a lot of videos of blacksmithing and i would love to take up blacksmithing as a hobby but yeah you can't really find them cocoa production has fermented under this kind of myth well to 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 touch on this matter yes there could be a lot of a, a number of um problems or mismanagement or blah 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 going on but this Cocoa production plummeting is also a, a climate-based one. The El Nino, which is basically um, a climatic event which affected the temperatures in the areas where cocoa production was was being done. And as far as I know, it increased because of humi humidity was increased during the El Nino type uh, period. It increased the prevalence of things like the black pod disease and stuff like that. So store all on the government, the climate also has a part to play with this. Uh, we need a new uh, research on the democracy, economy, and governance. Constitutional reforms. That's it. Uh, this government has received more revenue. Apparently, that's the case. Apparently, this government has received the most revenue from uh, com if you combine all the other governments. Uh, that's what I'm here. Uh, Akufo Adu is the president, is, is indeed the president Ghana never got. I was talking to this uh, Uber driver one time. And he, he, he said that he's, he was extremely happy that uh, Akufuadu was president. I was like, oh, really? Why? And he was like, because if Akufuadu was never made president, the, like the people who believed and supported him, they would never favor any person else. They would always be saying that, oh, he, uh, this person would have done better. Akufuadu would have done better. The, that, the, it would have been a, a naggy hanging thing over Ghana for all of history, but now that he's got gotten to show what he can do, now however you think about him, it's up to you. Uh, Hundred Ghana is really is calling for change. At the end of the day, um, the policies were really interesting. I feel like um, I feel like a lot was said as to the ability to execute all these things. I do not know. I do not know because I'm, I'm thinking about it from a fiscal point of view. If we are reducing so many taxes, but we are in turn going to build so many things, does that mean that we are going to improve our procurement lines? Because government uses a lot of money on procurement stuff. So uh, all in all, yeah, it's cool. It's cool manifesto. Ah, to give my own uh, manifesto, my wish list is that whichever government comes into power. Okay, this is a long shot. But it would be really cool if the NDC and the MPP could come together and be like, you know what, this four years, Mama, you're only getting this four years, so let's just charge it and let's do a Dragon Ball fusion type thing. And then we we'll work together to clean up what we are saying is a mess. Because both parts seem to be hinting at the country being a mess. And then we will control each other when it comes to fiscal expenditure. We'll tighten our ship. We'll finish projects that are already being done. And then we will not start new projects for four years. These things are really important. They are really, really important. What the one thing that this NDC manifesto was missing for me was the fact that I felt the NDC or Mahama should have talked about the fact that whatever we are going through to get us out of it is not going to be easy. Because that's the truth. It's not going to be easy. Certain concessions have to be made. Like, for instance, Maybe if there was a hospital that was supposed to be built here, there's a possibility that we can't build it because we need to save money. These are some of the things, real things that they needed to talk about and they did it. But I don't know, it was great, it was interesting. Um, I'll do my comparison hopefully tomorrow and then we'll go. So hope you guys enjoy this. 
uh jump in the comment section let me know what you guys think and unfortunately in this video as well because the clips <laughs> the clip things were a lot more than i thought so um have a great day everybody cheers